Well, welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. I'm Mike Roberts, and with me is Bill Barley, our resident expert in the, the travels around the gold fields of British Columbia and other places. We've been spending a little bit of time in southern parts of uh, British Columbia, but we're going to head north today. Quite far north, Mike, into the Atlan District, which is probably one of the most intriguing districts in the province, an extremely beautiful country. Some people thought they were in the Yukon in the early stages. In the 1890s, definitely. They thought it was either the Yukon or the Northwest Territories, and they got it rather confused. It was a big mix-up. Yeah. And again, one of those wonderful stories that occurs out of the early days is the, is the source of, uh, of the gold here. Yeah, the discovery of, of the gold in Atlan undoubtedly came from what we call the dying miner story, the, which we'll elaborate on later. The dying miner story, the story of the evolution of Atlan, Pine City, discovery some people called it. We'll do that right after this break. Roberts with Bill Barley. The dying miner theory, the source of the gold in the Atlan region. Yeah, undoubtedly one of the most well-documented theories that, out, of, out of that particular district, right? And it's well-documented because we have, we have the whole story right from the beginning to the end. Now, in, 18, in the early 1890s, there was a hotel in Juneau, Alaska, and it was Millard McKinnon owned the hotel. It was called the Circle City Hotel. And at that particular juncture, an old miner came into the hotel. He was sick. He was obviously dying. Miller, George Miller, who was one of the owners, took care of him. And he took care of him so well, the old, the old miner, just prior to his drawing his last breath, gave Miller a map and directions to find a creek. He said he and a band of miners had mined years previously. We don't know how many years previously. Could have been the late 1880s, undoubtedly the early 1890s. Mm -hmm. No later than that. So it preceded the Klondike rush. And Miller was so intrigued by the story of the old man, whom he believed, and the map, which was so accurate. But remember, this is a map of an area that hadn't been mapped by the Dominion government. So he was kind of flying blind to a degree, but the directions were so good that Miller in 1896, prior really to the discovery of the Klondike Rush, went into this area, crossed Atlan Lake, went onto a creek and found some old sluice boxes there, indicating that miners had been there. And although he wasn't an experienced miner, he soon found lead gold, which was very, very coarse gold, nuggety gold. Stayed there as long as his supplies lasted him, and then went back to his hotel in Juneau. By that time, the Yukon rush, or the Klondike rush, had started. And it eclipsed, really, his rush. But he decided to keep it quiet, and he did keep it quiet for two years. Finally, in 1898, he decided to tell his brother, a guy called Fritz Miller, probably Mueller was the original name, and a, a Canadian from Nova Scotia called Kenneth McLaren. He gave them the map, he gave them the directions, told them to follow his route, which they did. And in the midsummer of 1898, Miller and, and, uh, and McLaren put the first discovery stakes in on a creek called Pine Creek, right near the old workings of the original miners that had been there. Now, to record these claims, they thought they were in the Northwest Territories. They weren't. They were in northern British Columbia, but the maps weren't accurate enough. So they went to Taggish Post, and in Taggish Post, in charge of Taggish Post, was Inspector Darcy Strickland, who happened to be my great uncle. And he was so intrigued by this, and, and the, by the gold they showed him, which was coarse gold, lead gold all the way, that he and his whole detachment, another 11 constables, left the post, just temporarily, <laughs> to go down and stake Pine Creek. Just put up a sign saying, on holiday. That's right, above and below the, the, the discovery claim put in by, by both Miller and McLaren. And so Pine Creek became the premier creek in 1899 of, of the Atlan Creek Rush. And of course, after Pine Creek, they discovered Pr Spruce Creek by a guy called um, Marius. And, uh, and then they discovered a number of other creeks, Birch Creek and Boulder Creek and Ruby Creek and, uh, and Otter Creek and Wright Creek and McKee and the O'Donnell. So there were about 10 creeks, very, very marvelous creeks as far as coarse gold was concerned, but kind of a restricted area. And because of this, this unique discovery, now that the Yukon was, or the Klondike was a little bit on the wane, Atlan came to the forefront, and it was found to be in British Columbia, and they had to re-record, re they had to actually have a commission set up there to re-record all these original claims. All right, so that's the story, telling you, proving once and for all, to always be kind to old, sick miners. That's right. And uh, that if you're in a position of responsibility, take a, a couple of days off to, to go in and look in over yourself. That's right. And some of the maps they give you might even be accurate. Might even be <laughs> accurate. That's a good point. 
that brings us to the, I guess, the first of our historic photographs. You have uh, an album. Where did you pick up this well, album? Well, I purchased the album some years ago for a considerable sum of money from a bookseller in Vancouver, Stephen Lunsford. And uh, this is this is an, an album taken by the uh, by the Muirhead brothers, and it's they were some of the most famous photographers in the Atlanta district. These were the guys, that, and these guys are holding up. They're they're not record-setting nuggets, but they're holding up nuggets. They look so young, the two guys on the left. Well, yeah, and the guy in the middle, especially, he's about 14 years old, very small, isn't full grown at all. The owner is on the right. This is W. Breen, the owner on the right, and he's holding about a one and a half ounce nugget, and the man on the left is holding probably a half or three quarter ounce nugget. And they're, they're right on Pine Creek. So this is how Pine, the first diggings on Pine Creek were tackled. That's Pine Creek way off in the distance up in the left corner. Yes, it is. And beyond that is Pine City or Discovery. It was called by both names. And equal, no need even today as either Pine City or Discovery. And they're piping the water. They're actually running the water in on a sluice box flume. And this is to their working. You see the miners in the, in the lower right-hand part of the photograph. There's not much left of Pine Creek there. This is another method of mining. We haven't seen much of hydraulic mining, yeah. but that's what this is. Yeah, this is taken about 1901, and so they were starting the hydraulic as early as 1901. And you can see where they're bringing down the head of water, down the, down the, the pipes right down to the bottom. And there's your giant or your monitor, and uh, th that gives you a close-up of it. So they're, they're sluicing down or, or hydraulicing down the, the gravel, and the gravel flows through a bedrock, uh, a bedrock cut there, which comes down to the sluice box. And that's a fairly short sluice box. So they would get the coarse gold, but they'd probably lose a considerable portion of the fine gold mine. There's a guy at the head of the monitor aiming it. There's another guy at the top of the sluice box. He's just shoveling the slurry in there That's to beat the That's right. Band. He's trying to keep the box clean. Yeah. All right. Here's another. Now, this is an amazing device. The creativeness of early miners never ceases to amaze me. I've named it the muckraker. What is it designed to do? Well, the owner is sitting in the background there, and he, he's, he's handling it. And it's actually going in and takes out the muck from the bottom, and it works in reverse. That goes around, and those little little catches, they actually catch the muck at the bottom of that, at that little hole they're working in, and it runs it up that box. So it pulls it right up the box and dumps it into the sluice, and they keep on digging into that rather than throwing right into the box. Whether that was efficient or not is, is highly debatable, Mike. Some early technologist trying his craft. Yeah. There. This is what they're after. Well, sure. They, these, these are some of the nuggets. The one on the left is three troy pounds. Now, there's 12 ounces to 12 ounces to a pound troy in gold, so that's 36 ounces. That's a three troy pound nugget. And the one on the right is 28 ounces, a little over two pounds. The one on the left was from the most famous creek in the Atlan district, and this was Spruce Creek, which has produced, Mike, probably in the last 85 to 90 years, about 20 tons of gold now. 20 tons of placer gold. Now, those weren't big nuggets as nuggets go. Well, no, they weren't. I mean, the, these nuggets were, were, were large, but the larger nuggets were up to seven pounds. Seven pounds? Yeah, it, the Weston Hoffman nugget was 83 ounces, which is almost seven pounds. Got some of these wonderful artifacts that you've brought, in, that you've, uh, brought to us. This, I, I would think that the early miners would have enjoyed something a little lighter, but where would this unit be used? Well, th that was used, either, it could have been used underground, but it's probably used for cleaning bedrock, and it's ideal for cleaning bedrock, so the very, very good gold would be thrown into that, and they could go along and sweep right into that, Mike, putting that on bedrock and then, then using a whisk or something to sweep right into it, or they could actually use a, use a pair of tweezers or a sniping tool and put the gold right into that. So that, that was a, that's a very unusual item. Don't find many anymore. Sort of a gold dust bin, eh? That's almost. This, I mean, this doesn't look like a like a, a very large implement, but this is for picking in close quarters. That's right, it is. And it's ideal for placer miners. It's a two and a half pound pick, and uh, sometimes they have a steel shank. This particular one hasn't. So that's the head of the pick that they would have used in the, in the Atlan district in the 1890s. Somebody's pretty proud of their work. I mean, there's actually uh, crossed uh, some, sort, some sort of insignia oh, right sure, here. Oh, sure, cross pick and shovel. And two and a half pounds, and that's what you'd use in mm -hmm. close quarters. Yeah, and they're very, very difficult to get now. You need iron to get hold of gold. Oh, I guess. you bet. Okay. Some more of the historic photographs. This is a hotel at Pine City. The uh, Pine City was, there were two major towns in the Atlan district. One was Atlan itself, which was probably a population of some four to five thousand, and Pine City, which, uh, uh, which was between two and three thousand. It was a rival just, just on the southern end of uh, Surprise Lake. And, uh, this is, this is the most famous hotel in Pine City. These guys look pretty well to do. Oh, sure they are. And some of these men were making ex fabulous wages per day because they were in on the, on, the, on the beginning of the rush. 
I, I hadn't, for some reason, expected sternwheelers, but they came down Atlan Lake. Yeah, they did. They came down Atlan Lake from Carcross, and uh, this is the Gleaner, actually, one of the sternwheelers that actually pulled into 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 Atlan. Great name and, for uh, a sternwheeler. Well, sure it is. Could have called it the Sniper. Oh uh, yeah. And, and then they come right into Atlan. And this is this is this shows uh, Atlan Lake in the foreground here, and, and the city of Atlan in the background. This was taken about 1904, I think. This particular shot. It wasn't a mere head shot. So this would just be when Atlan is close to its height, maybe a little over the top. Yeah. There, is this one of, who was the name of the photographers, the Muirheads? These are the Muirheads, this is the Muirheads. They had great, com a sense of comedy and a sense of humor oh, when sure they, they took did. their stuff. Sure What's this one called? This is called Girl Wanted, and this is not unusual because the guy is doing his own washing and his only companion is a dog, and the, the dog, as you can see, is not helping in the washing, so, so that, uh, that, and of course women were a real premium. When a, when a woman came into town, I, especially a young woman, that it was not unusual for hundreds of miners to come down from the creeks if they'd heard of this yeah. and simply watch this apparition step off the boat. It was really <laughs> quite astonishing. And my grandfather mentions it because he was in Atlanta in 1898. Not my great uncle, but also my grandfather. And he mentions that, that, that when, they, when a woman came off the boat, uh, a young woman in her 20s, all, all the men would go down there and look at her. Not in any lewd or lascivious no. way, just in a, in a very honorific wonderful way oh no doubt about it dogs love having their pictures taken don't oh, they, sure they are. this They're... is the canine express does that really exist or is this another muirhead joke well no uh, muirhead has a sense of humor they're both muirhead brothers but but they, they definitely did use this particular wagon to haul around various express articles and uh, why not why not use the dogs instead of manpower here's a family outing and a half look yeah. at how many kids are there one two three four five six seven eight yeah. They can't be all one family. Well, it's hard to tell. It, it, it looks like it uh, could be, but it could be some neighbor kids in there, too. This is at Pine City, not Atlin, and uh, this is a holiday. So uh, probably the 24th of May, actually, Mike. It's hard to tell. They like their holidays. You bet. And this is the 4th of July in Atlin in about 1900, and they, you can see the hurdlers just finishing the race. And this is the winner here, and his, the second place man is just going over a hurdle on the right-hand side of the photograph. They were mostly Americans. I guess that's why the 4th of July And is... competing for fairly good purses, Mike. Yeah. There is the city as uh, Atlan became. Circa what, I what era? What year are we talking about here? Well, we're talking... This, is, this shot was taken in 1901. Again, a mere head shot. And it shows some of, the, some of the town of Atlan. Not all of it, but most of it. And it was a significant city at this time. Even then, it was probably close to 3,000. As I said, it was a couple of years beyond the, the big rush, which was really 98 and 99. Yeah. Again, the people who hauled the money made some money themselves. Oh, sure. They Somehow did. I always associate Wells Fargo with American history. Well, Wells Fargo was originally a California company, started in 1852, but, but it, was, uh, it was also well known in British Columbia and in the Yukon and in Alaska as well. And so this, this sign which you just held up was or was a Wells Fargo sign. And they were, they were, they were one of the favorite of the, I guess the favorite express company of the miners because they were so dead honest. Yeah. Wells Fargo's word was its, uh, was its bond. Would Barnard Express, the BX Express, get up as far as Atlan or were they more southern BC? No, although they did deal also with Wells Fargo. Yeah. Okay. We've got uh, some shots of some of the, the people who gravitated to this area. Without the government house, I guess you really didn't exist as a town. Yeah, this is the, this is the provincial government office in Atlan, still standing, by the way, Mike, and uh, indicates the importance of, of Atlan as, as a mining district, because this is a pretty impressive building. The fact that they did have to change from uh, the theory that this was the Northwest Territories to the fact that this was Northern British Columbia, did anybody lose any claims as a result of that transfer? Actually, there, there's some debate about that. And if you ex study the, the report of the commission that was sent in there to clear up this, this, this mess, because nobody really knew, and it really wasn't Strickland's fault either. He thought it was, he thought it was the Northwest Territories. They weren't, we're not very far from Fort Dagish. But it just happened to be over the line. Yeah. And they were in British Columbia. Well, they so they had to change to British Columbia mining lines. The banks went in there quick as could be. Oh, sure. The banks. There were three banks in Atlanta. This is one of them. This is the Merchants Bank of Halifax. And this is the Bank of British North America. And uh, again, it's rather interesting. If you get any of these old bank notes from these banks, these, these are quite important collector's items and quite valuable too, Mike. Yeah. And they, of course, made their money and uh, and lots of it oh, by sure by uh, what uh, 
would basically taking the gold in trade or what what was they would get they would get a premium on the gold they shipped out they would get a certain percentage and it varied from district to district obviously you wouldn't want to weigh any three pound gold nuggets in a scale no. like this this was a miner's scale it was a it was a portable scale he would use this on the claim just to check out quickly approximately what his day's take would be uh, you know that would hold probably maximum of about a quarter of a pound of gold in the pan with the weights counterbalancing on the other side and they would use troy weights in this too mike now when you talk about the word sniping you, you mentioned that word a number of times what's yeah. the what is the concept of sniping well sniping is is going over uh, usually going over old workings and uh, cleaning out crevices that maybe have not been cleaned out adequately by the by the first miner on the ground so that a sniper is an individual who goes along looking for uh, diagonal crevices and uh, seeing if the bedrock has been broken deep enough and so on and a really quite a fascinating way of making a living not so much anymore because most of the ground has been gone over although there are occasional spots Mike you can still snipe in and uh, do quite well at basic I guess like sniping the the rifleman picking off individual targets going after individual nuggets well these guys are picking off individual nuggets right yeah as so often is the case fire enters Atlan's history yeah, well, this is this is actually late late in the game for Atlan. This is 1914, and, uh, and this fire virtually destroyed Atlan. Although surprisingly, Mike, it came back after they shot because they were still working on these creeks. You see, you must realize that that Spruce Creek, the, the surpassed the actual by the by the 1960s anyway surpassed the 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 um, production of of Williams Creek and Lightning Creek, so that Spruce Creek became.